Wendy here at the Osterville Village Library and for today's first chapter Friday I'd like to share with you a book called Show Me a Sign and this is by Anne Claire Lazotte. I'm just gonna read a little bit from the flyleaf before we dive into the first chapter. Deaf author and librarian Anne Claire Lazotte weaves an own voices story inspired by the true history of a thriving deaf community on Martha's Vineyard in the early 19th century. Mary Lambert has always felt safe and protected on her beloved island of Martha's Vineyard. Her great-grandfather was an early English settler and the first deaf islander. Now, over a hundred years later, many people here, including Mary, are deaf and nearly everyone can communicate in sign language. Mary has never felt isolated and she is proud of her lineage. But recent events have delivered winds of change. Mary's brother died, leaving her family shattered. Tensions over land disputes are mounting between English settlers and the Wampanoag people. And a cunning young scientist has arrived, hoping to discover the origin of the island's prevalent deafness. His maniacal drive to find answers soon renders Mary a live specimen in a cruel experiment. Her struggle to save herself is at the core of this novel. Prologue. If you're reading this, I suppose you want to know more about the terrible events of last year, which I almost didn't survive, and the community where I live. Every small village must think itself perfectly unique. I now know there was not another like ours in America in the year of our Lord, 1805. For those who take hearing and speaking for granted, our way of life may be hard to understand. You may be fooled into believing that Chilmark on Martha's Vineyard, an island south of Boston, is a fancy of my imagination or the lost paradise that the English captain who named the land after his daughter was seeking long ago. I have tried to be true to every detail and to do justice not only to my friends and my family, but also to my enemies. I was the stranger invited to our shores. It was the stranger invited to our shores who changed my view forever. I warn you, there are accounts of great wickedness along with hope within these pages. As for my mastery of the language, I will remind you that not every writer comes to English from the same direction. My story is built not with brick and mortar, but by finding the right words and making events come to life. If it were a palace, it would have many windows and doors to see a reflection, peer into, and walk through. I hope you will be brave enough to enter. Mary Elizabeth. Lambert. Chapter 1. I like to walk early in the morning before I begin my chores, even in this crisp November weather. I use my birch stick to poke at curious things on the ground, like the tunnels made by moles. They go so deep, they churn up the sand below the soil. When I leave home early enough, I can see bright flashes from the gay headlight in the distance. But today, the sun is up. I run my stick across the top of the mossy stone wall that frames the high road and watch the sea glitter behind gabled houses with sloping yards. Sea grass borders the sand blowing lightly in the cool breeze. Blue crabs burrow into the mud near the shore where they will lay dormant for the winter. On the beach, there's little left of the humpback whale that washed up on our shores four days ago, delivered by the Almighty. My closest friend, Nancy Skiff, and I discovered the whale while playing. It was already dead when we found it, but its smell was not yet putrid. Small seabirds pecked at its carcass. Its sea-warm, mottled black skin was covered in humps and bumps. We were awestruck by its massive bulk. Nancy and I walked a large circle around it. I collected scallop shells, moon shells, and quahog shells, and put them next to the whale as a final offering from a human friend. Nancy took a recorder out of her cloak and played a song 
to guide the beast to its end. When Nancy and I ran to get her father, my papa, and the other men, they came with spades, knives, rope, and wheelbarrows. As they made plans to dispose of the whale, Papa, sensing my sadness, signed to me assuredly. Not one piece shall go unused, meat for the whole town, oil for our lamps, and baleen in the beast's mouth for brushes. I couldn't watch as our treasure was flensed, cut, and taken away piece by piece. I stop and write whale in the sand with my stick. I love words, but they confound me too. The way my mind thinks is not just in signs or English words and sentences, but in images and a flow of feeling that I imagine resembles music, which I've never heard. I watch the tide leaping in and out. I pass a stretch of high road that I have come to avoid. I circle round it as if it is a hallowed ground and head back home. Leaves jump and twirl ahead of me. The wind beckons me toward a small graveyard, but I choose to ignore its silent whispers. If you'd like to come and check this book out, show me a sign. It is part of our reading as a window to your world display here right in the front of the children's room. And we hope that you will stop in and take a look.